All right, here's unit six. Let's go through these questions together. Uh, question number one says from zero to two, for what value of b is this a uh, minimum? And so if you take the derivative equal to zero to understand it, but we can also understand it through the graph. So I'd like you to take the graph and we're just gonna graph cosine e to the x and understand what the graph gives us. So remember the graph, the derivative and the integration undo each other. So I'm just looking at the graph of cosine e to the x. That's really the derivative graph that I wanna look at. So let's look at that together. Take out your calculator and I just want you to graph. Don't graph the integration part, just cosine e to the x. So the derivative is what I'm looking for. So the derivative and integration undo each other. So cosine e to the x is the derivative and we're gonna look at the derivative graph to get our answer. All right, so this is what it should look like. And if you need to, press pause, and then you can do it too. But uh, graph this, and I graphed it on the interval from 0 to 2. And I look to see, this is now the derivative graph of what I'm looking for. So if it's above, it's increasing. If it's below, it's decreasing. And so at what point would you have a minimum value? So we have a little bit of increase, and then a lot of decrease. Notice how much more decrease than increase. And so it's a little bit increasing, and then it keeps decreasing. Even as it's rising, it's decreasing because it's below. And then it starts to increase again when it's above. At this point, 1.550, at that point, it would reach its most lowest value. So it rises a bit, it falls down a lot, and then it rises up a bit again. So that low point is right here at 1.550. So the answer to number one is D. Number two, oops. And number two, the antiderivative for f at x, so the, if g at x is the antiderivative for f at x, uh, and g at two equals negative seven, uh, then what's g at four, and which one would be that one? Move this just for a second. Um, and so this is a starting value problem. So we're going to start the value at negative 7, like here, and then we add the integration of the derivative. So if g at x is uh, antiderivative, then that f at x is the derivative, like working backwards, right? So if g at x is the antiderivative, f at x is the derivative of g at x. You kind of have to work backwards here. So f at x is the derivative, if you read it carefully. So the derivative is f at x. And we're going from, so the x value is 2, and we want to know 4. So we're integrating from 2 to 4. So start at negative 7, we're adding, and this is going to give me the increase from 2 to 4, and the derivative is f at x. So they use the variable t in this situation but it would be the same situation whether it's t or x in terms of understanding it. The answer here is e. Next question. Number three, Fall, the flow of oil barrels per hour, you're given a rate graph, and there's July 9th, 24 hours, which best approximates the total number of barrels that pass through the pipeline? Now, for this question, if you integrate a rate graph, all you need to do is find the area underneath. So if I find the area from 0 to 24, it accumulates how many barrels? We have a rate. The area underneath the rate graph is an accumulator. How many barrels would there be in those 24 hours? How can I approximate it? So if I look first about how to approximate the area, I see a rectangle. In fact, I see a rectangle right here to here. So do you see that rectangle that I just highlighted? Um, what's the area of that rectangle? So it's 24 by 100. So already, I'm gonna go 24 times 100. That's 2400. And then the next part, so it's 2400 to begin with, because that's the area. And then I wanna find this area up here as well. Now, this area up here is like a, a triangle. I wonder if I can even get a better understanding of it. I probably can't quite highlight it, but um, I want you to see that it's like two triangles put together. 
So if I was going to estimate the area of this curve, together that would make one rectangle. So one rectangle here is 6 by 100. That's 600. So this is what it would look like. So for number 3, we start with 24 times 100. That's that rectangle. Plus we have two triangles there at the top. If you put the two triangles together, it actually makes the one rectangle. So one rectangle is 6 by 100. So if I was going to approximate, that's what I would approximate. And so over those hours, the area, approximate area, is 3,000. So the answer was uh, D. Number four. All right, you're given a table of values, and you're asked to find, uh, use a right Riemann sum. And what is the approximate number of liters of oil in the tank at 15 hours? So let's be a good reader. The tank originally contains 50 liters of oil. So we're going to start with 50, and then we're going to add, and then how much did it accumulate from there? We're going to integrate this rate from 4 to 15 using a right Riemann sum. So these are not equal intervals. So these are going to create rectangles. So the width of the rectangle, uh, the first rectangle, 4 to 7, the width is 3. And a right Riemann sum, the height of the rectangle would be 6.2. It's the right one. The next rectangle goes from 7 to 12. That's 5. And then a right Riemann sum would be 5.9. So it's 5 times uh, 5.9. And then the last one, 12 to 15, that's 3, and it'll be times 5.6. So this is what it would look like. So that's the amount we started with, and this is the Riemann sum of the three rectangles. And then calculate all of that, and you get 114.9, and the answer is C. Number five, let f at x equal that function. At what value is x a minimum? To find a minimum, we're going to take the derivative of what I see. So if you take the derivative of an integration, they undo each other. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so if you take the derivative of this, they undo each other, and the top bound just gets plugged in. It's a substitution question. So if you substitute it in, Take out t and put in x squared, subtract 3x, and it's squared. And then the derivative of x squared, subtract 3x. That's the hook at the end. So you take the derivative of the bound. So that's 2x subtract 3. The denominator, or the denominator, the bottom bound is a constant. So when you take the derivative of a constant, that would just be 0, and so we don't need it. So we've taken the derivative, and we're now going to make it equal to 0. So we've taken the derivative, including the hook, and now we make it equal to 0. Now, e to whatever will never be 0. I don't even want to spend the time expanding this. This would never, ever equal 0. This will always be a positive value. So the only thing that could equal 0 so notice it's like it's factored. There's a product. So the first part of the product can never be 0. So only this could be 0. So make it equal to 0, and you have your answer. So the answer is 3 over 2. And if you did a number line to make sure it's a minimum, if you plugged in a number like positive 1, you get a negative answer. Remember, this is always positive. And if you plug in a number like 2, 2 times 2, that's 4 take away 3. That's a positive answer. So you can see at 3 over 2 is a minimum in terms of what we're looking for. So the answer is C. Number 6. Number 6 there at the... I'll move me. So number 6, let f and g be continuous functions. And it says from 0 to 10... For f at x, it's 21. 
And for 0 to 10 for that, it's 1 half g at x is 8. So I'm going to write this down to have a better understanding. So from 0 to 10, f at x dx equals 21. Now I want you to notice that 1 half can be in front of the integration instead of inside. And if it's in front, we can multiply times 2 just to make, see what g at x equals. So we're given this. Notice the 1 half. I can then multiply both sides by 2 to undo this. And so I can see that the integration from 0 to 10 of just g at x, not the 1 half, is actually 16. Now, in the question, they subtract these two values. So when I subtract these two values, the answer is 5. So in other words, when I integrate from 0 to 10, if it's f at x subtract g at x, if I subtract those two answers, uh, the answer is 5. So I need that number. Um, and then it says from 10 to 3, if you want f at x subtract g at x, um, the answer is 2. And then they're asked, okay, so if that's the case, then from 0 to 3, f at x subtract g at x, what does that equal? Just using some properties of integration. So we found out already that if I go from 0 to 10, the answer is 16 for g at x. Or in, if I subtract it, sorry. So if I go from 0 to 10, and I'm subtracting, the answer is 5. In the question it says from 3 to 10 and I subtract, the answer is 2. So then what must be the answer from 0 to 3 taking those numbers? So one way to visualize this is think of this from 0 to 10, the answer is uh, 5. But if I went from 3 to 10, only, the answer is 2. So what must this be so that it adds up to 5? So in other words, I'm subtracting these to get the answer, because that answer is 3. So I'm going to go 5, subtract 2, and that answer is 3. So the answer was A. Number seven, similar question, no numbers involved here, completely conceptual. So I'm going to draw this out a little bit. So F and G are continuous from A to B, and C is in the middle from A to B. So this is how I'm going to visualize it. If I go from A to B for F at X, If I go from A to B, the answer is P. If I just go from C to B for F at X, the answer is Q. So one of the questions is going to be, is I need to figure out from A to C what the value is for F at X. So let's see how I'm going to do that. So, so far this is what I got, oops, there it is. So from A to B, the value is P. From C to B, the value is Q. So I need to know what this value is, and all I need to do is subtract these to find this value. So if I'm integrating from A to C, F at X DX, it would be P subtract Q, kind of having that number line as a way to structure it to understand it. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the second information given. So from A to B for G is R, and from C to B is S. So when I subtract them, it gives me A to C. So using the same understanding for G, I'm going to take R and I'm going to subtract S.
And then it says take these answers and subtract them for your final answer. So if I subtract them, the end answer is going to be P subtract Q, subtract R, and then when you subtract a negative, it'll be plus S. And so you get P subtract R, Q, subtract R, subtract S. So the answer there is B. All right, number eight. In number eight, you're given a graph with area, and it's bounded from negative four to positive four. And it says, uh, think of these areas. Now, when they say A1 and A2 are positive numbers, A2 is still a negative answer because the area below is negative. And so it says that if you go from negative four to positive four, that would be A1 subtract A2. So that would be A1 subtract A2. And then it says negative 2. And then I'm integrating from negative 1 to 4. That's negative A2. And there's your setup. So you have A1 plus negative A2, that's the whole thing. Subtract two, and then you multiply times that area, but it's negative because it's below. So a negative times a negative makes it positive two A2. Combine like terms, two subtract one, and you get A1 plus A2. And so the answer is D. Number nine, which of the following is an antiderivative of this? In other words, which one, when I take the derivative, would equal this? A is wrong because there's a hook of 3x squared. So is B wrong. Um, all of these have a hook involved. So if I plug it in, this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, so it's substitution, but it has a hook of 3x squared. It has a hook of 3x squared. This is the only one when I take the derivative. It's a substitution question. Plug in x for t. The hook for x is 1, so there's no hook. It's just the square root of 1 plus x cubed. The answer to number 9 is e, because when you take the derivative of each one, that's the one that matches the question. Number 10. Let f and g have continuous first and second derivatives everywhere. And it says the function of f is always above, less than the function of g. In other words, g is always greater than f. In terms of the graph, when you look at a graph, then one would be higher than the other. And then which one must be true? And so when you look at the derivative, uh, they're nothing. The, the derivative, what that means, whether it's increasing or decreasing, that has no effect if one's higher or lower. But number three doesn't have an effect. So if integration is the area under a curve and one is higher than the other one, then the area of one is always going to be greater than the area of the other one because one is always higher on the graph. So number three would match. If f is lower, the integration will always have a lower value because the area is going to be less because it's lower compared to the x-axis. So the answer to number uh, 10 is C. Number 11. It says, if the second derivative is given, which of the following could be f at x? So we're going to write this down. So step one is to integrate to find the first derivative. So if I integrate 2x, you add 1 to the exponent and divide. That's going to end up with x squared. The integration of cosine is just sine, so it'd be, it's negative. The integration of cosine is uh, negative sine, which makes it positive, blah, blah, blah. So it ends up being positive sine x, because a negative and a negative is positive.
Now try that again. So the integration of cosine is sine, so it would be negative sine x plus the constant. There's a little bug flying around here. So we have x squared minus sine x plus c. And again, we're going to integrate that. So that's giving me the first derivative. So I got to go back one more time. Integrate again. This gives me x cubed over 3. The integration of sine is negative cosine. So a negative and a negative makes it positive. Um, when you integrate a constant, it would just be some constant and then x. And then we have another constant after that. So which of the ones could match this, where that could be any constant with x and another constant after it? So that's going to match A in terms of the answer. Number 12. If a trapezoidal sum over approximates. Now for a trapezoidal sum, it would over approximate when it's concave up. So for a trapezoidal over approximation, it would be concave up. That would produce something that is over the curve, like more than what the area is. And a right Riemann sum under approximates. So that means it's decreasing. So when a right Riemann sum, when a function is decreasing and you do a right Riemann sum, it's a under approximation. So in other words, it's concave up and decreasing, which one could match that? So look at this one. Is this concave up and decreasing? The answer is A. So all the rest would not match it. Number 13. The function f is defined like that. What's the value of the integration from uh, 1 to 5? Because we have a piecewise function that separates at 3, I need to set up two integrations. So one integration is going to go from 1 to 3. And the other integration is going to go from 3 to 5. And then I just solve them and add up the answers. So if I integrate 2, I just get 2x. If I integrate x, it's x squared over 2, and the integration of negative 1 is negative 1x, and again I'm integrating that one from 3 to 5. So this is what it looks like. So there's the first piece, and the integration. So for the first piece, first you plug in 3, so 2 times 3 is 6, subtract, plug in 1, 2 times 1 is 2, so the integration for the first piece is 4. If I look at the denominator, or the bottom piece, uh, plug 5 in, and you get 25 over 2 minus 5. And then plug in 3, and you get 9 over 2, subtract 3. And then I'm just going to add up these answers, however I feel like adding them up. So 25 take away 9 is 16 over 2. So 25 take away 9, 16 over 2, that's 8. So, so far we got 4 plus 8, and then I got negative 5 subtract 3, subtract 8. So if I put it all together, wait a second. When you subtract a negative, you're adding. So it's negative 5 plus 3. So this is negative 2. Ha. Huh. So 12 take away 2. I got that. The answer is 10. So the answer is D. Number 14. Again, a piecewise. So for this piecewise, I think it'd be helpful to understand this. I'll show you my page here. Is that ultimately we're finding to integrate this one. They ask to integrate from uh, 0 to 3, and absolute value means this part that's underneath right here, 
that part is just going to be reflected up. And then you find the area under the curve. So take 3 negative 1 and it becomes 3 positive 1. Redraw it and then find the area under the curve. This is what it would look like if you did that. So redraw it. So put in 3 and positive 1. And then you're finding the area underneath each one here all the way through. So the first shape is a trapezoid. You go one half, the bases are one and two, you add the bases, and then the height of the trapezoid is one. And then we have a triangle, half the base times the height, a triangle, half the base times the height, they're actually the same size. And then if you put it all together, so add up the, so these are the two triangles, this is the trapezoid, and then if you do all the math together, the integration all together, adding it all up is 5 over 2. So the answer is D. A calculator question, number 15. So if the function is defined this way, and g is an antiderivative of f, so that g at 3 equals 5, then what's g at 1? So if g is an antiderivative, then f is the derivative of g, like working backwards. So this is the derivative for g. So how we're going to set this up is a uh, starting value problem. So the value starts with this value, 5. So we write down 5. And then I add and integrate. Now, in this case, I'm actually given the value for 3, and I'm working backwards to 1. So I'm going to integrate from 3 to 1. Now, because of that, I'm not going to add. Instead, I'm going to subtract. So because I'm given a starting value with 3, but then i got to work backwards to 1, normally I would add. But in this case, I subtract because I'm working backwards. The derivative of g is f at x. And that tells you how much it's increasing. And this is the setup you put in the calculator. So you go 5 subtract, and it'd be integrating from 3 to 1 this. Put that all in your calculator. And if you did it right, it'd be negative 1.585. So the answer is b. Or here, let me see. I think you could, sorry, make that, I think that if you keep it adding, by integrating from 3 to 1, it would uh, change the sign of it because the lower bound is bigger. Let me make sure. So I'm integrating from 3 to 1, because I'm working backwards. And then it's the square root of x cubed plus 2. And there's your answer. So yeah, so you can still be, it's adding. And because we're starting at 3 and working backwards to 1, automatically because the bounds are switched whatever the answer is the sign is going to change so it works backwards for you all right number 16 another calculator question so the function of f is given and it says find the average rate of change well the average rate of change is just the algebra formula for slope so from zero, from 0 to 3, it would be f at 3, subtract f at 0, and then divide by 3, subtract 0. 
So that's the setup. And then the function is an integration. So just type it in the calculator. So you're integrating from 1 to 3, and it's the square root of t cubed plus 2. That's that. And then subtract, and now plug in 0. So it's from 1 to 0. Same thing. And that's all divided by 3. So just plug in 3 first, type it out, plug in 0 next. So this is f of 3, subtract f of 0, divided by 3, and your answer would be 2.694. So try it on your calculator, see if you get the same answer as me. Number 17. Number 17, what's the integration of secant tan? That's a formula. So the integration of secant tan, in other words, what derivative gives me secant tan? And the answer is just secant. So the antiderivative of secant tangent is just secant plus c. So the answer is a. That's one of your formulas at the beginning of the book. 18. In number 18, you're given the derivative, and it says which of the following must be true on the interval from 0 to 2. So if that's the derivative, and they're talking about increasing and decreasing, then what must be true here is when I plug in any number between 0 and 2. Um, that answer always, so e to whatever number is always a positive value. So if I plug in any number here between 0 and 2 as I integrate, this is a positive answer. And then if I talk about concavity, so the derivative is always positive. Because e to whatever exponent will always be a positive number. So the integration of that positive value is going to be a positive integration. The second derivative, so if you take the derivative of this, they undo each other. So the second derivative gives you concavity. So the derivative, again, they cross out. It's a substitution question. So plug in x squared. You just have e to the negative x squared. And again, if you plug in any value between 0 and 2, it's always positive. So the derivative is always positive. The second derivative is always positive. What does that mean? That means it's increasing and always concave up. The answer to number 18 is A. Number 19. Let f be this function. On which of the following intervals is the graph concave down? So I need to take the second derivative. So let's do the first derivative. So if I did the first derivative, they undo each other and just substitute x in. So this first derivative just would be 2x cubed subtract 15x squared plus 36x. If I take the next derivative, the second one, you'd get 6x squared minus 30x plus 36. Make it equal to 0 and you're going to solve it. Going to divide everything by 6, factor it, So the two answers here are positive 2 and positive 3. Draw a number line for the der uh, second derivative for concavity. So 2 and 3. Know that this is a parabola where the ends go up and then it crosses in the middle. There's different ways you can do it, but if you understand the end behavior and it crosses at each one, then you can do it quicker. Um, but where is it concave down is where the second derivative is negative. So between 2 and 3, it's concave down. So the answer is D. Number 20. And number 20, it says a left Riemann sum, a right Riemann sum, and a trapezoid are used to approximate the value of each using the above. Uh, the graph is shown above. Which of the following gives an underestimate? So 
if it's increasing, the left Riemann sum is an underestimate, not the right. So increasing the left, so if I draw a left one, you see that rectangle? It's an underestimate. That was really good. I can't believe I did that part. And then the right Riemann sum would actually be like this. And so you can see the right Riemann sum is an overestimate. And then how about the trapezoidal? So if it's concave down, it's an underestimate. Concave up, it's an over. So the two that would give you an underestimate is one and three. So for Riemann sum, it's increasing or decreasing. For a trapezoidal sum, it's concave up or concave down. I'll take practice to remember that. So it's one and three, so the answer is D. 21. Let F be continuous on the function closed by zero to two. It says if F at X is between two and four, here, then the greatest possible value of this integration would be what? So for this, the greatest value for f at x could be, for here, is 4. So plug 4 in for f at x. So I'm trying to find the greatest value. So I'm taking the greatest value for f at x, I'm plugging it in, and then I need to integrate it. So the integration of 4 is 4x, and I'm integrating from 0 to 2. Plug in 2 for x, that's 8. Plug in 0, it's 0. So the answer is just 8 is the maximum value that it could be. So the answer is D. 22. In 22, you're given the graph of the derivative, and it's shown above. If f is 0, equals 5, then f at 1 would equal what? So the starting value of the function is 5. So we're going to start with 5. And then we're going to add the integration from that. So write down 5 to begin with. That's the beginning value of the function. And then to know how much it increased from that number, you take the derivative. And we're going from 0 to 1. So we're going to integrate from 0 to 1, the derivative, which you see. And so how do you integrate from 0 to 1 off a graph? You just find the area under the curve. That's a triangle. Just find the area of that triangle, half the base times the height. So the area of that triangle is 3. So if you add it together, that means f at 1 equals 8. Five plus, and you integrate to know how much it increased from five. That's the area under the derivative graph. So it's five plus three is the area of that triangle, so the answer is eight. So the answer is D. 23. Twenty-three is a calculator question. So it says you see a quarter of a circle and you see a line segment. And it says the slope of this line is negative one. Uh, let b be a positive number. Uh, can you find the value of b? So from zero to b, what value for b would make the integration zero? Well, what would make the integration zero is when the area above matches the area below. So I'm going to set up an equation and then use my calculator. So first of all, what's the area above? What's the area of that quarter circle? So the area of a circle is pi r squared. Our radius is 3. And then I divide it by 4 because it's 1 quarter. So let's start there. So I want to know for the other one, So you have the area above and then the area below when it equals 0. 
So because the area below is negative, that's why I'm subtracting. And then when does that equal zero? So let's see if I can set up something for the area below. So the area below is going to be a triangle. So like somewhere here, oops, somewhere here, when you find the area of a triangle, when does it match that? So what is the area of a triangle? So the area of a triangle is one half the base. And so whatever the B is, that base would be B subtract three would be that base. So I'm going to go B subtract three. So whatever the value for B is, if I subtract three, that gives me the base. And for whatever value of B that is, the height of the triangle would be the Y coordinate of that line. So I actually need the equation of that line to know what the height of the triangle is. So take the point three zero. The slope of that line is negative one. And then come up with the equation of the line which will give you the height of the triangle. So what's the equation of the line using these values? So the slope is negative one. It'd be X subtract three plus zero. So if you put it together, it would be negative x plus 3. So the height of the triangle would be to plug in whatever that b value is. When I plug it into this, that would give me the height of the triangle. So it's negative b plus 3. All right. So the height of this triangle is going to be negative anyways, whatever that value is. So when I plug it in, so like if that, the B value was 6, it's going to be a negative value anyway. So I don't need this to be negative then. So we can just add those up and make it equal to 0. So we have 1 plus the other. When it equals 0, what value for B would make it 0? So use your calculator, press solve, so go to menu, algebra, solve, type this in, comma B, solve it, and you'd see the answer is 6.760. So try, and you can do it, and see that's the answer. So at 6.760, the area of the triangle matches the area of the quarter circle, which then gives you an integration of 0. Next one. All right, for number 24, you're asked to integrate from 2 to 12. And what you see is a half circle underneath. Integration is finding the area under the curve. And so this is what it would look like. Let me show you my page here. So we're finding that area. So from 2 to 12, it's this area that we're finding that is the integration. Now, in order to do that, I actually need to see two shapes. So one shape is a rectangle. So do you see that big pink rectangle? What's the area of that rectangle? Is length times width. So that's 10 by 6. So the rectangle is 60. What's the area of the circle? Well, it's a semicircle. So that's 1 half pi. The radius of this circle is 5, half of 10. So I have the rectangle and the semicircle. And I'm going to subtract those to find the area of what's left over. So that's 60 subtract 25 pi over 2. Now there's a last thing I need to think about. So I took the rectangle and I subtracted the half circle. But the next thing I need to recognize is this area is under the axes. So not only do I have to take the rectangle, subtract the semicircle, that's going to be a negative answer. So that would give me negative 60 plus 25 pi over 2. So the answer is C. Number 25. 
25, there's no tricks to this one. Just integrate and find the answer. So you can do it, I can do it, press pause, however you feel. So um, there is no hook. The derivative of x plus 1 is 1, so it's ready to integrate, which means I just do the anti-power uh, rule. Add 1 to the exponent. That's 3 over 2. Instead of divide, use the reciprocal. And we're integrating from 0 to 3, just like that. So there's the integration. And then plug 3 in first. Subtract. Plug in 0. And then can you evaluate to get the answer? So let's see. 3 plus 1 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. And 2 cubed is 8. 1 to any exponent is 1. And 1 times negative 2 thirds is negative 2 thirds. So I have 16 over 3, subtract 2 over 3, so my answer is 14 over 3. Which is D. Number 26. In 26, you're asked to take the derivative of an integration. This is a fundamental term of calculus question. When they undo each other, you just plug in the bound. So root x gets plugged in, but the derivative of the bound creates a hook. So step one is to substitute in. So instead of t, put in root x squared. And then the hook, the square root of x is x to the half. So the derivative of that is 1 half x to the negative a half. So the square root of x squared is just x. Uh, 1 half means it goes in the denominator. And x to the negative a half means it also is in the denominator. And so I'm looking for an answer that looks like that. And so the one that matches it, you don't have to go in any order, is a is the one that matches it. They actually have 2 root x and then 1 plus x. 27. If y equals this, which of the following must be true? And so when I look at each option here, they're all taking the derivative. So when I look at 27, the derivative of 5 is 0. And the derivative of an integration means you plug in. It's a substitution question when you derivative and integrate. Substitute in 2x, but then we have the hook of the bound, which is 2. So if I put it all together... It would be e negative, and then it would be 2x squared, and then the hook is 2. So that's what the derivative would look like. So you substitute in, and then the derivative of 2x is 2. That's the hook. And then the next part is, if you substitute in, oh, fly went right at my eye. Um, the next part is what happens when you plug in 0, right? No, what is the number? y at 1. So if you plug in y at 1, so put in 1 for x. When you integrate from 2 to 2, there's no area. It didn't move. So 2 to 2, this is 0. So the answer is 5. So the correct answer is e when you simplify it, and that y at 1 equals 5. So that's the correct answer. Number 28. Let f be that function f at x equals 9 to the x, and use a Riemann sum, 4 equal length. So how do I do that? We're going from 0 to 2, f at x dx. So first I need to find the width. So to find the width, I subtract the bounds divided by 4. So 2 take away 0 divided by 4, the width is 1 half. A right Riemann sum, I take the right value. So the width of each one is 1 half. So the first right value would be 1 half in for 9. So it would be 9 to the 1 half. And then it would be 9 to the 1. And then it would be 9 to the 3 halves. And then it would be 9 to the 2. So every half is the interval. And it's the right value that I'm using for the height. 
So this is what it would look like. So the width is one half, that gives me my interval. So every half, if you need to, you could do this. Those are your rectangle widths. Zero to a half, use a half. Zero to one, use one. One to three halves, and three halves to two. Those are the values for a right Riemann sum. Let's plug them in, and then all you have to do is evaluate this and get your answer. Now, the square root of nine is three, and three cubed is 27. So it's three plus nine plus 27 plus 81. Half of it, if you do it right, it's 120 divided by two, which is 60. So the answer to that is uh, C. Twenty-nine. All right, this is a calculator question. If that's an antiderivative for f of x, then what is it from one to two? Uh, what you would put in the calculator. The derivative of that then is uh, what you would put in in terms of inside. So f of x is the derivative of that. If we go the other direction, so this is what you'd put in the calculator. It's the derivative of sine. 1 over x squared plus 1 from 1 to 2, you can type it in, dx. And that will give you the answer negative 0 0.281. So you should definitely try that. So the derivative of sine then is f at x, working backwards. So plug that in. That's what you would type in the calculator, and that's the answer you get. And so the answer 29 is a. Number 30, in number 30, you're asked to find the average value. And it gives you the value. Now, average value means you integrate this and divide by the difference in the bounds. So we're integrating f at x from 0 to 8 and then dividing by the difference in the bounds. That's what average value is, just like that. So you integrate and divide by the difference in the bounds. Now, how do you integrate off a graph is you use the area of that, and it's just given. A is 14, that would be negative 16. Uh, this would be positive 50, all divided by eight. And that answer is six. And that would be A. Number 31. And number 31, you're supposed to integrate this uh, from 0 to 5. So from 0 to 5, find the area of this small triangle, half the base times the height. Find the area of a semicircle. That's one half pi r squared, where the radius is two. So if I put that all together, half the base times the height, the semicircle, which is one half pi r squared, the radius is two. That's what it would look like. So it'd be three over two. Uh, four divided by two is two pi, so it'd be three over two, two pi in the answer choices. Instead of 3 over 2, it's 1.5. The answer there is D. 32. In number 32, G at X equals that. And so we need to take the derivative of G to find F. So the derivative of G would be uh, 2x subtract 3. And then it says integrate f at x, which is 2x subtract 3 from 1 to 3. So the integration of this is x squared minus 3x, but no constant. And it's 1 to 3. So you're going to plug 3 in first, subtract, plug in 1, and then simplify that. So it's 9 take away 9, 
This is 1 subtract 3, negative 2, but the negative in front makes it positive 2, so the answer is C. Thirty-three, it's just a basic integration question. So just integrate each one separately for number 33. So add one to the exponent and divide. Add one to the exponent and divide. And we're integrating from negative one to three. So this is what it would look like if you add one to the exponent and divide. And if you divide by two, you get only one x, negative one x squared. Then you plug in three plug in negative 1, and then simplify that. So this again is not 9, take away 9. This is uh, negative a third, subtract 1. So you end up with negative uh, 4 thirds. So this is negative 4 thirds, but the negative in front makes it positive 4 thirds, so there's your answer. And so the answer to that is B. Number 34. Uh, again, just add 1 to the exponent and divide for 34. So if I add 1 to the exponent, x to the 4th, divide, that becomes 2x to the 4th. The next one, if you add 1, it would be x cubed divided by 3, so it's just minus x cubed. And we're integrating from negative 2 to positive 1. So there we do the antiderivative, add 1 to the exponent and divide. And then the last part is uh, plug in the upper bound first, then plug in the lower bound. So plug in the upper bound, then plug in the lower bound, and if you did it correctly, you get the answer negative 39 when you do the work and evaluate it. So the answer is C. Number 35. Step one is to do the antiderivative of this, so integrate it. You actually don't need a calculator for the antiderivative, but you could do it. So if you wanted to, feel free, because you get a calculator. So the antiderivative here is just ln x to the fourth divided by four um, plus c. Then it says that you have a point, and the point is one zero that we're using. So if I plug in uh, one for x and make it equal to zero, ln 1 is 0, so c is 0. So the actual function value for capital F is just ln x to the fourth divided by 4. The constant 0 at the end, and then it says find f at 9. So then you'd use your calculator. You would type in ln x to the fourth divided, use the vertical line, x equals 9 on your calculator, evaluate at 9, or just go ln 9 to the 4th divided by 4, and your answer is 5.827. And that answer is C. Thirty-six, you're given a graph of F says h is the integration of that. So which of the following is it increasing? Well, the derivative of h would tell me if it's increasing. So the derivative of an antiderivative, right? They undo each other, plug in t, x for t. This is a derivative graph for h, and it's increasing when it's above. So right here, it's increasing because it's above. So from 3 to 9, it's increasing because this now is the derivative graph of h for h. And so the answer is E. 37. They undo each other. Substitute in x squared for t, but it needs the hook 2x. So if you simplify it, the answer is E. For number 38, use your calculator. I'll show you the setup for number 38. 
f at 1 equals pi. So we start there. And then we're integrating from 1 to 5. So again, from 1 to 5, the derivative. And if you did that correctly, you get 27.814. Try it with your calculator. Next, 39, you're given the derivative, y at 0 equals 20. So we start with 20, we add, and we're going from 0 to 6, and then we take the derivative after that. And then we need to know how to uh, evaluate this. So. Uh, the hook is negative one half. What it was over what it became. So negative ten divided by negative one half is twenty. Then you can unhook the rule for e is you just copy it. So it's twenty e to the negative two over ten, and we're integrating from zero to six. And then you're going to plug in uh, six. Uh, subtract, sorry, 6 divided by 2, which is 3. And then subtract. When you plug in 0, e to the 0, you get up, just subtract 20. And so 20 subtract 20, you're left with 20e to the negative 3 when you simplify it. So the answer is B. Number 40. So again, this is a starting value problem. So in number 40, you would start with 7. And then you're integrating from 3 to 2. And you're integrating the derivative, cosine uh, x squared dx. That's what you type in the calculator. Notice 3 to 2 means you're going to be working backwards. And then the answer is 6.759, if you do it correctly. Number 41, so the answer is D. Number 41, uh, the integration of sine is a negative cosine. So it would be negative cosine x from 0 to x. And then the upper bound subtract the lower bound. Now cosine at 0 is 1. So negative negative 1 makes it a positive 1 with negative cosine x. And that's why the answer is E. Number 42. We're going to write it calculus friendly. Let me show you the work. There it is. So we write it calculus friendly. The derivative of negative x squared is negative 2x. So what it was compared to what it became, that's 1 over negative 2. That's where it is. Then you can unhook negative 2x. Add 1 to the exponent, that's 3 over 2. Divide or times the reciprocal. The 2's cross out, you have negative 1 third, that plus C. And so the answer is Where are we at? Oh, the answer is E. Ha. Huh. I said stop. I got one more. So what is the antiderivative of that? 3 secant squared x plus 2. The antiderivative of secant squared is just tangent. So it's 3 tangent. The antiderivative of 2 is 2x. And then we need a constant. Where's the answer? 
And so the one, if the constant's zero, then that would be the answer. But that's one of the answers. The other answers could be any constant after it. All right, Mr. G Math, over and out. We got to number 43, halfway there. I'm super proud of you that you're doing your work and earning your way to that uh, exam pass.